Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, you know, uh, tonight I wanted to talk to you about nonviolent leadership. And I think the reason is, is this sort of current ascendancy of political leadership that prides itself in tough talk singularity of vision, reducing everything to good and evil, <coughs> using fire with fire in defeating opponents. I think this is deeply discomforting to many people, but most especially to people working in the field of peace. Please come down. Hi, Jill. Hi, how are you? I have an old classmate of yours from Jarvis. Oh my God. Anna. The summer of 73, remember? <laughs> <laughs> we hitchhiked. I saw your name in the paper, I'm like, I wonder if it's Jill. I haven't seen her since then. I, I didn't mean to you. make an exit. It's so good to see you. <laughs> ah. um. <laughs> but I always run late. <laughs> <laughs> Should I start again? So we're, we're talking about nonviolent leadership. And um, I think, you know, we're just uh, this tough talk, singularity of vision, reducing everything to good and evil, fire with fire in defeating opponents is deeply discomforting language, and especially for those of us who are working in the field of peace. There seems to be a kind of legitimization of violent leadership, even in democratic states. And so it's difficult to avoid responding to such provocation and aggressive discourse but maybe this kind of leadership requires less criticism, more self-introspection, a time of cooling down to rebuff fear that is constantly being elicited from the general public through the media, fear of enemies, fear of immigrants, and refugees, fear of foreign businesses, fear of war. Because this fear and making people fearful is what is giving this leadership ascendancy. So the question here is what do we derive? What can we derive? from our collective experience to wrestle with this new surge of hateful discourse without joining its chorus? Is it fearlessness that we keep in mind or is it just avoiding asserting the opposite? Those that have singularity of vision always want to demonize the opposite and create fear. It may be prudent, therefore, to avoid falling into this trap and risking intensifying the conflict. So this presentation tonight with you is meant to envisage a different set of possibilities by looking at two examples of nonviolent leaders that work, in, that work today that are practicing nonviolent values and seem to be very successful. This, with these two examples, there are many. We don't have time for too many. But I think these two examples reset the stage on how we need to see leadership. Now, as Meta said, as someone who has worked with people in field situations using a Gandhian approach, at the community levels in India for many years. 
You know, I wanted to come back to Canada and do research on Gandhian nonviolence. Little did I realize how much has been written on Gandhi, my gosh. Um, how much to comb through. So many people have spent their lifetime interpreting Gandhi's work, interpreting nonviolence. But my interest is to see what are the areas of Gandhi that make sense in terms of our contemporary period and in terms of facing these issues that I've mentioned of leadership. So let me name two, you know, two very profound <coughs> and important parts of Gandhi, which I think make sense, that are not just theoretical, that have a lot of practical application. One of those is around Gandhi's notion of the unity of all things. And what is, um, what is really interesting about this is this essential unity does not mean there's a universalism, right? This, as we've seen in, in academic research over the last number of years, tends to eclipse the particular. Diversity, difference, and that has to be respected. But what is interesting about Gandhi is how he was able to bring the universal together with the particular. In other words, without being philosophical, being very practical, Gandhi had a notion of a constructive program, which he unveiled in 1941, just as he was seeing independence coming to India. And it was an 18, it was a very short book. Anyone could pick it up at the library. And it basically had 18 points. But the idea was that through these 18 particulars, if you will, 18 diverse areas, one had a unity of a constructive program. One of those points was on what he called in the book, a removal of untouchability. As you know, in the caste system in India, the outcasts are a caste of people that have been demeaned uh, in Indian society for centuries, millennia. And in fact, Gandhi worked hard not to get rid of Hinduism, which he was a great supporter of, but to get rid of the areas of Hinduism which were an anathema to equality and to justice. One of those was untouchability. So while Gandhi, in his constructive program, was working on a sarvodie, a well-being of everybody, an inclusive vision for all, within that, he worked on removing untouchability. So this is an example of the particular of uh, trying to raise an identity issue of a certain group of people, but not disrupting the unity or the broader coherence of what one may call a holism. Now, the reason I think this is important is because in today's India, like today's North America, there has been a considerable amount of work done on Dalit inequality. Dalits are the new name given by uh, Baba Sahib and Bedkar to the outcasts. Dalit means oppressed people. So this Dalit community which Gandhi was calling by a different name, but this outcast community, the Dalits, was, uh, is seen that we need to assert, of course, the rights for Dalits. But what does this assertion mean in terms of the well-being of the whole? 
So what Gandhi tried to do in his uh, removal of untouchability was to try to get upper caste Hindus to realize that their duty was to remove this horrible uh, scourge from Hinduism of untouchability. Uh, you would not be surprised to know that upper caste, some upper caste Hindus did not like that. And Gandhi himself was assassinated by a Hindu who believed that Gandhi was subverting Hinduism and was very soft on Muslims. So uh, I use this as an example to show politically, although there could be an argument I could give theoretically, but uh, in the interest of understanding how it applies, I've given you a political uh, analogy of what he meant by the unity of all things and yet not losing sight of the diverse diversity and difference of people within a given society. The second very important point about Gandhi, which needs to be mentioned before we go into the body of the, of the, of the discussion, is that Gandhi believed in what one would call a transformative nonviolence. Transformative nonviolence, right? So nonviolence was not something passive. It was something active. At its highest, uh, in its highest form, if you will, because you have to advance in becoming, in being able to use transformative nonviolence, it's not something you do from day one. It's something that you work on over time. But at its height, what transformative nonviolence was for Gandhi was a moment of transcendence <coughs> where the conflict is actually the relations between the conflicting parties changes. Right? So in other words, there is a word Gandhi used which was called sityagraha, nonviolent resistance. He used the uh, uh, a Hindi term, truth force, which actually means if I am a, no, a person without power and I am actually struggling against a person with power, I will take on a satyagraha, nonviolent resist resistance. In Gandhi's frame of reference, <coughs> I would have to sacrifice. I would have to be conscious of uh, trying to find an inner uh, truth to what I was fighting against. In other words, in many of the conflicts which Gandhi was involved with, he would always say the person without power always had to fairly express their grievance. Not to dramatize it, but to fairly explain it, and then to persist in holding on to that grievance, no matter what your, not your opponent, but the other, the person who does have power that you're in conflict with, what they do, okay? So then, in a transformative nonviolence, if I suffer, right, and if I sacrifice, the idea for Gandhi was that the other person's moral conscience would be affected and they would want to change the conflict. That was the basic idea of Satyagraha. So if you're in conflict with someone and you're on two levels of power, you are trying to evoke a reaction from the other through your sacrifice of yourself. That is basically Satyagraha. Now, what is interesting about this as a non-violent method of conflict resolution or transformation is that 
it does transform the conflict because, and this is quite, this was where Gandhi's brilliance was quite significant. He thought that you can protest your cause, <laughs> but until you change the other guy, you're not going to succeed in your protest. In fact, a protest can actually create the opposite. You can actually harden opinions of the other against you. I think this is an important lesson. And it's not something that is simple. It's quite uh, something to reflect on. Now, how are we going to reflect on this? Because this is all very fine unity of all things and transformative nonviolence. Let's put it into an application. Because then you can see it and what it means. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with a uh, introduction to the first of two persons that I'm going to talk to you about today. This person, her name is Ilabat. Uh, Ilabat is from Gujarat. She runs the Self-Employed Women's Association. Yeah. And this um, is in Western India. She's from Ahmedabad. And this is her picture. In fact, I'm sorry, it's so big. Uh, she's dancing with poor women. Ilabat is an absolutely phenomenal human being. I'm going to show you a quick clip to show her being honored by the President of India, by the Amitabh Bachchan, the head of, you know, the Bollywood, all of the elite in India in 2013 honored her as one of the great women of our era, you know, which is unusual. So why is Ilabat such a heroine? <coughs> well, Back in, she, be, she began in a trade union. But the trade union was actually Gandhian. So we often think that trade unions are based on a class analysis that is, in our sense, of a trade union. Workers, management. This trade union, was, which was actually set up by a woman, totally invisible in history, unfortunate. Her name was Anasaya Sarabhai. She was part of the Sarabhai family, a, a philanthropist family, a big textile um, business house is her family. And she set up this trade union of poor workers in the 20s and ran it for 50 years. Ilabat joins her trade union, gets really enlivened by this woman in India who's running this trade union, and learns very, in a very tough way what it is like to organize poor workers who are totally, I mean, there's absolutely no working conditions. There, some of the workers in the early days of this textile labor association, this union, uh, worked 36 hour shifts, you know, absolute labor exploitation. So this woman in the 20s, Anasaya of Sarabhai, sets up this union, runs it for 50 years. In the 1960s, she's joined by Ilabat. And Ilabat joins it because it's Gandhian. She's been influenced in her upbringing by Gandhian uh, thinking. And she begins to understand that the trade union negotiation of a Gandhian union is based on trying to see the codependency, or if you will, the relationship that workers have with management to find common goals rather than seeing them as separate and then they're demanding uh, higher pay or higher wages. They rather are working in a trusteeship relationship to understand how they can both move forward with the same goals. Um, 
And this was a form of Gandhian trade union organizing. So Ilabat begins with that uh, organization, and then she realizes as the textile industry is laying off more and more people, because in fact, uh, you know, there are changes in the market in the 60s and 70s, she realizes that all the ancillary workers who are carrying bales of cotton on their head and are doing stitching with cotton and so on, are running, are going down in their employment because the textile mill is going down. So she begins to organize women. And to make a very long story short, you would not believe with totally non-literate women, SEWA, Self-Employed Women's Association, sets up a bank that is run by poor women uh, and it now has 1.2 uh, million uh, people who are um, in this cooperative bank. And the managers of this cooperative bank are non-literate women, okay? So what Ilabat does, not only in a cooperative bank, but there's 120 cooperatives and nine unions that have been formed, is that she not only empowers women, but builds their capacity to actually transact their livelihoods so that in the earlier days they would be pure labor, but now in cooperatives they're negotiating with their contractors, you know, as uh, carrying out enterprises. And this happened over 30 years. So that's all very well, but I thought we were talking about peace, you might ask. Why am I raising this? I'm raising this because the state in which Ilabat organized this incredible work is a state which was the, you may say, the nesting ground for the Hindu parties in India. And it is out of Gujarat that the present prime minister emerged. He was chief minister there for three terms, I think, in Gujarat. So that because Ilabat was building up links with poor women around all these economic cooperatives, she had 40% Dalits, those are the outcast community. There was 30% Muslims. There was 30% other caste groups, and they were all working together because they're poor, you know? And the, as, the ascent, as the rise of some of the Hindutva uh, parties in the politics happened in Gujarat, suddenly she, Ilaba, and Sewa were in counterpoint with the state. Yeah? And what is extraordinary about this is the way she handled that kind of opposition. Now, you would be surprised to know that in 2002, right, in 2002, uh, there was a communal riot. There was a communal riot where um, within three, you know, there was a, it, it, it happened where um, 58 Hindus had come back from a particular uh, temple, they wanted to build a temple in Ayodhya, and they came back and their bogey was burned. It was called Godra. And, um, and what happened was there was, in three days of killings, thousands of people were murdered, and in the following three months, there was mass killing, rape, and pillaging, okay? It was huge, it was, a, it was a mass murder. And it was known all over the world. And it was known all over the world, okay? Now, what is really amazing is this woman and Sewa, because it had a mixed group of people, they stayed together. They did not get divided. Not only did they stay together, but high caste Hindu women 
were serving all different uh, diverse groups of women in terms of their re in, in terms of the five relief camps and they were giving sewing machines and they were giving income earning activities so that women who had lost suddenly their house had burned down and they're you know they were in a terrible position at least they could immediately start sewing and and produce some material to get some money to feed their children and this it, it, it was such a uh, big episode that clearly those people who were sponsoring the Hindu communal riot found this very disconcerting. And so this is why Sewa suddenly became seen in a very negative light. But what I wanted to tell you is that Ilabat did not get cynical. You know, I think when you see that kind of violence, you know, you tend to become so cynical and so upset. But what happened is that she continually reaffirmed her commitment to a common humanity. And that is transformative nonviolence. That is something that is very, very hard to do. It's much easier to point to you know, the enemy, the opponent. And what she said at that time, what she said to me, that she said at that time was, so people have, are good at heart. They have a conscience. If we remain conscious, they have a conscience. Your, your own conscience guides you all through at all time. Your conscience always knows what you have done wrong. It will always tell you. So, you know, um, she said, I have great faith in our women and our people. Not everything is lost. The basic culture is still there. The basic faith is there. They know what is truth and what is not. So in the final stages, when it comes to trust, it succeeds. You do whatever you do, but keep know that this is our biggest capital. So I think when you see, you know, so much conflict and you have to confront that level of conflict, whatever your political viewpoints, but when you have to, you know, uh, it really is something. And what it, uh, before I, I, go, I go on, I just want to show you that in spite of, I may need my friend again, sorry. Mm. I just want to show you. For empowering women in villages with jobs, visibility, and dignity. In every right, a living legend, Ila Bhatt. सेवा में आके बहुत हमारा फर्क आया हमारे पक्का मकान होया टेलीविजन आया लाइट आई Who are the women of India 80% of women in India are rural poor illiterate and uh, and economically very active so it is these women who should be playing a leading role in the women's movement of India I feel so humbled and proud uh, today, and uh, I'm uh, I'm fortunate also to be asked to say uh, you know, three messages for the for the next generation, right? So first and foremost, we need to recognize that poverty is violence. It is violence perpetuated with the consent of society. A society that is silent or looks the other way in the face of poverty. It is giving consent to exploitation, injustice, and war. Poverty strips away a person's dignity, humanity. It corrodes the human spirit. 
there is no justification for poverty in India. Number two, diversity. Diversity is the key to life. Our world is richer when cultures and subcultures flourish, when faiths and subfaiths intermingle. We need a multiplicity of economies and sub-economies that coexist in harmony. Monoculture or standardization of practices are, uh, are nothing but ways to managing nature, managing people. They are not life-giving forces. India's rich diversity needs the spirit of Bahuda to sustain it. And lastly, uh, let us recognize that we all live in correlation. The word is Anubandh. We are all bound to each other in the wave of life. Every action of mine has an impact on me, on the community around me, and the world. Uh, you know, Mother Earth. Uh, by being mindful of our interdependence, we bind ourselves to each other and to the world. My vision is of a world without poverty, full of diversity, and interlinked in mutual harmony. The vision, this vision, is our gift to me by poor and working women, my Seva sisters, and, and over, over the past 40 years. Now, I try to give it to you. Thank you. She was being given uh, one of the global greatest women ever awards yeah, in that session. And you may have seen the president of India. You may have seen you know, the kind of luminaries that were there is pretty much uh, some of the, the elite of India. But what were the three things that she said? I think what is important is what are the, the uh, three things that she said. Um, the things that she said were basically the greatest scourge is poverty and exploitation. Right? And um, she said that that India needs to live in pluralism and not uh, in violent relationship. Right? And um, what was the third thing she said? Um, uh, Poverty is violence. No, that was the first one. Intolerance is violence. Yeah, intolerance was so the. So that uh, it needs to live in pluralism. Right. So basically, what I wanted to to show you was how she had linked uh, poverty and violence, and how she saw that both in terms of interrelationship. Remember, the last one was interrelationship, right? The common humanity. <coughs> and what, what do we want to learn from this here? I mean, in our context in Canada. I think that let's say that we learned something about self and other from Imabat. Um, you know, we live in a very different world here than people live in India because there's, there's a high degree of individualism in a Western context. We have an, in, in a context, we have an intellectual tradition which has, has created this sense of enlightened self-interest and we always see the other with a certain amount of suspicion or fear. You know, that's been driven into us because of the, the kind of way we have defined politics and uh, over since the Enlightenment. And I think that there is a real difference in India in terms of individual and collective. And something that we really need to become attentive to, which is that the collective, because it is a, of course, it's a, a more clan-based society, but the, there is a, uh, a belief which Gandhi uh, and, and Ilabat has picked up on, which is this belief that people will do the right thing, that they don't need to be regulated to do the right thing. 
Uh, Gandhi was, was quite a, uh, I mean, he believed in rights, but he believed that if you don't have duties, you can't have rights. You know, that if you're going to really work in a community or a collective sense, you have to have some sort of duty to the other if you're going to be a rights holder. And the, the very cooperatives that Ilabad has set up, you see that kind of collective women working together. Now, these are the poorest and most exploited women you can imagine. And yet they have been able to set up banks, set up enterprises, and yes, they face tremendous problems with the market in terms of making a living, but somehow in these groups they have gained a kind of identity and a kind of power that has meant that they are creating peace at the bottom, but they can also respond to incidents of violence, not as individuals, but knowing that there is a collective and interrelational sisterhood which gives them a strength. So in terms of the self and the other, uh, we tend to regulate with human rights to protect our rights, but we're always afraid that they're going to be abused. And I think they have, they've got a different picture in India. I am not suggesting that what they do in India we should do here. I am suggesting that if we're going to change leadership, we need to see different ways of carrying out leadership. And Ilabat has worked organically at the bottom with grassroots communities to bring up women's leadership. 87% of the leaders running these 120 cooperatives are non-literate women who have never gone to school. And they are the leaders because the organization has given them a sense of their own dignity. And I just add to that that my own work with women has been absolutely the same experience. That at the grassroots, if women come together and feel as if they can stand up together in, then they have a lot of confidence to do that. It's almost as if you have a huge, huge energy uh, which you're capturing. Ilabat has captured that energy, that what she calls natural leadership. Uh, what she says is women want stability. They, they want roots for their children. They're, they're, they, they'll happily share their veranda. Women are communicators. They're networkers. They have natural leadership, okay? So just to conclude uh, Ilabat, because I don't want to belabor the point, I think the Anusaya, uh, I told you about Anusaya Saravai as her mentor, they really understood something called shared understanding, you know? that when you're in conflict, you work on shared understanding, not proving a righteous uh, argument against the other. And this is something that is very subtle, but they built a whole labor movement around it, and it continues as say what today. Um, people like Jean-Paul Lederick, write about this uh, in his own conflict transformation in similar ways. Okay, let us move on to a second leader, right? I'm trying to show that the leadership is not with Gandhi who died in 1948, that the ideas that Gandhi had actually are alive and well, but we have a real blindness in terms of seeing these things. We would rather see other things. And I think uh, it makes sense, particularly as we face this, uh, the leadership today, um, and the kinds of problems that we have today, we need to take note of it. OK, I move you on to Vandana Shiva. Now, Vandana Shiva is known as someone who fights against genetically modified organisms. She stands up against agro-industrial giants like Monsanto. 
She tries to talk about food producers. She's gained a lot of notoriety about these things. But what is not seen is how she practices peace. And part of the reason is that for the past 30 years, she's been trying to say that violence is the basis of policy making. Um, and it needs to shift to a peace perspective. Now, you know, there are many people who line up and support her. There are many people who are her detractors. But I think one cannot deny that her exposure of Gandhi from childhood, seeing the struggles of the Chipko movement, not as a peasant organization, not in a class or um, of, of, you know, that kind of context, but as an ecological movement, her close association with Arne Ness has got her to raise an issue about making peace with the earth that the link between the destruction of our eco-resources and the destruction of people is something that has to be taken seriously. Now, you know, um, Johan Galtung spoke about direct and indirect violence. And he showed indirect violence as structural violence. He talked about it as unintended, structure-generated, rather than actor-generated harm done to human beings. And he was saying that in 1969, because he was actually shifting the whole Cold War perspective of conflict resolution from east-west to north-south. And he, he was a peace researcher at, you know, at Oslo University. He set up the center. P, uh, the Peace Research Institute. He couldn't change the structural relationships himself, but he certainly was an advocate. But you know what? Someone like Vandana Shiva has raised economic, structural violence in India in a profound way. And the problem is, is like the emperor has no clothes. People don't want to hear it. Because it's, it's, it's a very, it's a profound thing. Let me explain. Vandana began writing, I used to know her in this time. She wrote in the mid-1980s about the Punjab Green Revolution. And what happened in the 80s, in fact, was there was a rise of uh, a group of people that wanted uh, Punjab to leave India as a separate state. It was called Khalistan. And there was a huge conflict between Mrs. Gandhi, who is in the central government as prime minister, and this group in Punjab. And when she, of course, she, she later was killed by her bodyguard, who was a Punjabi. And for some reason, people around her thought all Sikhs were bad and murdered 2,000 people within the space of a very short time in Delhi. So Vandana in the 1980s is watching this, these Punjabis being killed, and she's trying to link whether there's a link to the Green Revolution. Now, nobody else is thinking this way. She says, discontent that had expressed itself in Punjab in the 1980s was the result of a centrally controlled agricultural production and the resulting economic and political crisis. It was located in the center state politics and the political economy of the Green Revolution. What she showed is that resource struggles, whether it's around forest, water, land, sea, creates many people who get dispossessed. And because they're dispossessed, they create civil unrest. And very often you get violence as a result of that civil unrest. She had the courage to make these connections. Most people do not. And with that courage, she went on and she wrote many other things. But one of the things that she did as globalization came and then the whole discourse around terrorism is she said, come on, you've got to also see that behind this is 
introduction of biotechnology, seed patents, impounding water for large dams, hijacking all the resources. If you don't see this, how can you see that? And she basically raised the structural economy issues which Galton talked about 20 years before that. And these, what, what was very interesting about Van Damme, because she studied here in Canada, so I, I would just like to spend a moment on that, is she, cre she saw this as a paradigm of separation and fragmentation of knowledge. She saw that if you can't connect a civil strife with the complete destruction of agriculture, you're not seeing them in relation to each other. And therefore, you have a fragmentation and separation of knowledge. So what she did was she, when she was in Canada, it was very interesting, she came and studied at Western University the history and philosophy of science. And she did her uh, dissertation work on quantum uh, physics which was basically on hidden variables and the non-locality of particles in quantum theory. Now, what is interesting is that at that moment at Western University, there was a colloquium on quantum theory. And people came, this was sort of post-Heisenberg, so people came with all sorts of interesting ideas of connecting um, you know, uh, uh, you know, particle physics with, you know, they're not really, they're pure energy or whatever, you know, lots of discussion. And the, those were the days you remember of the Tao of physics and Capra and, you know, so in people's minds, in her guide's mind, Jeffrey Boom, he was uh, influenced by David Boom, who in fact was a very, very big uh, uh, theoretical physicist, they were connecting Eastern mysticism with Western theoretical physics. And she came back from Canada, she came back from Western uh, Ontario, a Western University in Ontario, uh, saying that actually everything is in flux and everything is dynamic, and so I'm going to study ecology and show that that's all dynamic also that it's not, in fact, static. So she moved into the ecological sciences, actually ecological policy, policy studies, and began to write about ecology. And then she realized how fundamental the relationships between ecology, nature, women uh, were, and really thought interrelationally. So she brought back a way of thinking that was quite interrelational. Uh, and as a result of that, began to s uncover, uh, you know, all sorts of violences that were going on, as which she wrote in her Staying Alive and Ecofeminism. As globalization took hold in India in the 1990s, and it was clear that industrial agriculture was part of that globalization and biotechnology, the introduction of um, uh, genetically modified seed and so on, she began to see that something was happening, that, um, that there was a big change taking place. And I want to read this because I, f I find this a, quite an extraordinary uh, uh, statement. She tells about how she went to a meeting of chemical companies in Europe and realized they were going into the business of patenting seeds. She said, on my flight back, I made a matrix. First, I saw the industrial revolution was based on coal. What did coal give us? Industries. What did those industries do? They mechanized, they did things like textile production. What did they grab it for? Well, markets, cotton, indigo. You know, there were many struggles in India around indigo. How was it fought back? Well, Gandhi and the spinning wheel, of course. OK, second industrial revolution, chemicals. Rachel Car Car Carson, you know, the concentrated response of polluting the earth with chemicals. And she said, now what do we have? We have a third industrial revolution where they're trying to industrialize, industrialize life. These are GMOs. They, they, you know, 
And uh, she didn't know at that time about BT Cotton and Roundup Ready. Uh, but the industrialization of life was clear. So what now? If not a spinning wheel, what is it? Aha! It's seed. It's life. It's that which we have to defend because without seed, there's no life. If companies take all the seed and manipulate the seed, we become dehumanized. And it was her vision of how life, human life, is being dismantled that she came back and started fighting against intellectual property rights and the manipulation of agriculture. Now, people may find Vandana Shiva dramatic, which she is, and um, full of words. She's written 17 books and co-authored another 24. Um, but the relation she had, relationship she has made to the indirect violence, the structural violence, the economic violence in our system is clear. And I think um, she recently wrote something about the Syrian conflict, and I wanted to just raise this. In a recent writing, she said, you know, Everything is governed by separation. She, she said this just before the COP uh, 21 in, 19, in 2015 at Paris. She said, you know, uh, everything is governed by separations. We never look at the root causes. It's, it's all, we get caught up in these media spectacles. Now, the situation in Syria, in case people didn't know, but we have a Syrian in our audience to confirm this. What happened in Syria was that in 2009, there was a drought. One million people were uprooted. <coughs> Agricultural production uh, was lost, 75%. Cattle died. This was a prolonged drought. And what happened is these pastoralists moved towards Damascus to try to find food, survival. This movement of people created a lot of civil instability. And as a result of that, boom, you know, the financial institutions come in because they see an advantage, according to her. Uh, and they begin to give loans to the government to sort out this problem, but then they're getting more in debt on those loans, and lo and behold, the arms merchants are just behind them. So what she was able to show is how this instability created this conflict. And she makes the comparison today with the four million refugees, which are creating huge instability in Europe, and saying conflict is just going to be behind it. And if the present um, uh, refugee crisis continues as it is today. She has, she has estimated that it's going to be one billion people by 2050. And with that kind of refugee movement, there's going to be a lot of war. So this is how she is a peace person. This is where she uh, comes in. But what is quite astounding about Vandana is that she doesn't stop there. She's always looking for a way forward, you know? She doesn't give only the gloom and doom stories. She also says, let's try this. She worked on her Futures of Food, Futures of Seed manifestos in 2007, and I was with her when she did her Terra Viva, it's called Our Soil, Our Commons, Our Future, in Italy in 2015, when she gathered a bunch of people to really look at roadmaps for future actions, how to bring ecological rights together with human rights, how to look at the present economy as linear, that the present economy is linear and extractive based on the logic of exploitation, threatening ecological and social collapse, whereas if we had a circular logic of the law of return, of mutuality, of reciprocity, of regeneration, we would be in a peaceful, more peaceful state. So I just want to show you uh, her speaking so you can see her for yourself. 
see, that's the wrong one. The year 2015 offers us such a big opportunity to return to the soil. And I'm so glad the European Greens are responding to the Year of Soil by organizing a big conference, which is also a lead up to COP21 on climate change. So 2015 is the year we can remember that we are the soil. Humans are made from humus. Adam is derived from Adamus, the Hebrew word for soil. We are nothing without living soil. And today we are witnessing that as waves of refugees are created from lands which were desertified, devastated through exploiting of the soil. Across the world, across Europe, soils are dying, both because they've been neglected, they're being encroached, they're being cementified, and industrial agriculture is killing the life of the soil, while it's emitting 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions, the nitrogen oxides from chemical fertilizers, the carbon dioxide, and the methane from factory farms and food waste. We can get rid of all of these emissions by doing ecological agriculture, returning organic matter to the soil, producing healthier food, producing more livelihoods, protecting our small farmers, protecting biodiversity. We have everything to gain by turning to the soil away from fossil fuels that should have stayed underground. The soil needs more living carbon. The dead carbon should never have been the basis of our civilizations. It's a 250-year-old era that should be put aside. It has given rise to a fossilized mind, a fossilized mind that thinks of nature as dead, of human beings as disposable, of societies as disposable too. The refugee crisis is rooted in that idea of disposability as entire cultures are bombed out of existence. If we make peace with the soil, we make peace between people. We solve the food insecurity problem, we solve the unemployment problem, we of course solve the climate problem. And we don't just solve the problem by reducing emissions, which is the heart of all discussions. In the soil is a way of pulling out the stocks of the buildup of excess carbon dioxide in the soil. We take it out of the air where too much carbon dioxide doesn't belong, put carbon into the soil through the amazing magic of the photosynthesis of our green living plants. And through this, turn from the extractive logic of destruction to the cycle of return, to gratitude, to the earth, to our past, to our ancestors, and to the future, to whom we owe a living soil. Let's not miss this challenge. Together, we can change the paradigm. We can change the practice. And we can begin with our everyday eating of food in a conscious way. OK, yeah, this one. So what she does is says, this is the linear logic you know, that we're caught in. And it's rupturing our relationship uh, between you know, nature and human beings. And she says, we need a circular logic. So I'm not going to get into the details of Vandana Shiva. I just wanted to say that if I can find two models to bring to you tonight, um, there must be thousands. And why are we not trying to find these alternative, nonviolent leadership models to bring to bear so that we are not forced to endure hierarchical structures that are not nature friendly, that are violent. So this is the question that I have for you tonight. I wanted to say that part of the, the, the work that many of us do in India is to mobilize people to think this way, common ordinary Indians. And this is the work that um, is also being done here. And I wanted to say that, you know, Science for Peace is doing tremendous work, and there are so many, there are so many people that are. Um, but the Gandhian idea of Satyagraha, which it was picked up by Jean Sharp, yeah. is something that needs real attention, real attention, because it's the only way that I've come that I've
come that I've seen in my life where people can be re-empowered at the grassroots. Um, you know, uh, Jean uh, wrote this incredible book, the, uh, three volumes, in 1973, The Politics of Nonviolent Action. It has all the techniques and strategies of nonviolence to, for mass action to resist authoritarian power. It's amazing. What we need to think about beyond techniques and strategies, which are important, we've got to think about what that structural violence is that we're engaged with in our community. What are the grassroots communities that can be brought together, as we saw in the Ilaba, and how do we effectively carry uh, a vision of something different forward? And I just uh, feel that this is an important moment. Um, for thinking and acting on this. And so I wanted to conclude now and to get your questions or any discussion points you might have on this, uh, because I don't want to belabor just an Indian scenario. I would rather us try to figure out how all this applies to our situation here. Thank you.